We're going to be looking at the mechanics of the spirit realm. Amen? You ready, Joanne? Some things may ring in here and you'll be like, I see this stuff in the apartment with everybody around me, right? Mm-hmm, I know. Here we go, principalities and powers. Here we go. Everything communicated to us in the scriptures is deliberate and important. Every word, every sentence, every teaching, I believe is there by the Holy Spirit. Every single word of it. God has destined to us to be communicate to be communicated to us. Amen. And if it is to be communicated to us, what does that mean? We're supposed to know it, right? So everything all the meat and potatoes and the vegetables, we need the whole meal, don't we? Amen? And so we need to take these things seriously and have a basic understanding. It is essential in my view that we also get an understanding of the mechanics of the spirit realm and how things work on the other side. Why? Because God hath saith, right? He has given us a lot of information so we're not blind to how things operate. So we're going to have Halloween right now in June. Ooh. We're going to be talking about some heavy-duty stuff right here. Yeah. Get ready. I was going to bring my pumpkins out for this one. In today's teaching, here's generally what we're going to cover. We're going to be talking about some basic mechanics of the spirit realm. We're going to be talking about the two kingdoms. And we're going to, I'm going to open up two very specific examples in the Old Testament that show us a deep, a detailed look into the spirit realm. So we're going to be reading some scripture. Amen? How many know it's good to have some public reading of scripture? How many know so often in church we'll skip around to one, two, or three verses? It's like, oh, could, could we actually study a chapter in church sometime? Well, why not? Amen? In the old days, and I'm talking the early, early days, they would study the scripture for hours at a time. Amen? We're very limited to two or three hours of teaching a week where we can gather. And so, you know, I'm very passionate during this time to open up the word and do it right. Amen? So let us begin. The spirit realm versus the natural realm. We know that, you know, if you, some of this you'll go back to when we studied the rest of the gospel a couple years back. Some of the principles are the same principles, but I'm just going to review them for those of you that didn't necessarily uh, were here and, and learn this stuff. It's always good to review, isn't it? Amen? Paul said constantly, remind yourselves of these things. What does that mean? Sometimes we've got to hear it over and over and over. I know I'm a dummy sometimes. No excuses, Sal. You got Joanne. She remembers everything. So let me explain. I try to do my best to put an educational graph up here, right? A little picture of kind of how it works. The line. We all remember the line? What, what does the line represent? Robin? Yes? Yep, yep, spirit, it's just, there, there's a separation. Science calls it an event horizon. An event horizon in quantum physics is the beginning of a new dimension. So there is a certain line somewhere out there between the spirit and between the earth realm. We can't see it, but we know it's there. It's very clear that it is there, amen? So there is a vast difference between where we sit right now and where God is right now. Where is Jesus right now? Right, right. Jesus, a man right now, is in the eternal realm. He's the only man in, or in the eternal realm right now. Every other person is a spirit body. Amen? Except for a couple of people who got translated. There's only a couple, though. But basically, he's one of the only men right now. Every, all the other believers who have passed on, what, are they, what form are they in right now? Spirit. They are separated bodily. The body has died. And be, when the body dies, 
that your skin suit no longer can operate, your spirit can't stay in it anymore. It's the only thing that keeps you here. The life force in your body keeps you attached to the world as gravity keeps your feet on the ground, right? Same thing. It's like a gravitational pull. When your body's able to sustain life, your spirit is gravitationally pulled towards the natural realm because you're a human being meant to live in a body. And so the spirit realm is an upper dimension. The Bible has many different descriptions about it. In fact, Paul talks about his experience being uh, taken in a vision, or some say a near-death experience when he was being stoned, into the third heavens. And we're going to talk about that eventually, but it, it, just as an example. So the eternal realm is the, the higher dimensional planes, and physics, quantum, quantum mechanics, which is physis, physicists, right? They have guesstimated mathematically that there's at least 11 higher dimensions than, than the four that we live in right now. Right? We live in, we live in a four-dimensional realm right now, but they believe there's 11. So very well, could there exist consciousness in other dimensions? It's absolutely a possibility. We believe as Christians that that is the reality, right? And so the eternal realm is where the spirit realm is. You know, I, have a, I, have, I suspect that the spirit realm is actually all around us right now. It's not a faraway place outside the universe necessarily. It's just another dimension that we can't see right now, right? You know, for instance, well, mechanics proves if you take this chair right here, right? Uh, the reality from a quantum mechanics point of view is the chair is not really a full reality. It's a construct. And what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is it's, it's not a chair in itself. It's made up of quadrillions of atoms that spin at a certain speed, right? And together those atoms, in our reality, we see a chair, right? I can touch a chair. Why can I touch a chair? Because my molecules in my body spin at close to the same rate, which makes us solids, right? Gases spin at a little... Uh, uh, they're, they're less dense. So there's less density in the atom field. So gases, I can move my hand right through the oxygen field that I'm in right now. Water is just a little bit different, right? Liquids. Just a little bit in between gas and a solid. We know everything's solid, liquid, gas. But if I could make myself at a subatomic particle size and I just disappeared and I went to a wee bit little guy that chair to me would look like the spaces between it would be the size of this room and I could walk right through it. So in that sense, the chair is not truly a reality. It's a construct of reality, right? And the only reason it's a reality to us is because we're made of the same material. Everyone understand that? And so, you know, there's, there's good evidence that and Dr. Chuck Missler, who just recently passed away, did a lot of work in this field, that the entire universe is a digital construct and it's not even a true reality. Isn't that amazing? It's made of, of digital information, energy, and fields of atoms. And you could say, now, you know, you ever read about how science is exploring this dark matter and all this stuff? You've seen some of that stuff? Because they're, they're figuring out, even the quantum physicists are starting to realize there's something more to the reality than just the locality that we're in. They've discovered that you could invigorate or, or charge a particle in this room, and a particle at equal distance at the other side of the universe will feel its effect, and they don't understand why that is. Yeah, they, they, they can't, they're like blown away by this stuff. And when God, when God said, you know, and he spoke the universe into being, we obviously would have to, we're obviously as believers, we believe we're coming out of a higher dimension and we're a lower dimension, so it should be that way, right? It, the, the lower should reveal something higher, amen? It's just fascinating stuff. And so... In our reality, we're made of energy, mass, space, and time. These are, these are four-dimensional realities that we all experience, right? 
right? We, we have energy. I can move my hands. Why? Because my body produces energy. We see energy all over the... Look at the winds blowing. That comes from energy, right? That comes from, from hot and cold mixing and pressure differences in the, the atmosphere causing wind. It causes the air to move. That's from energy. We are a dimension of mass, and this is what this, one of the big things that, that makes us distinct from the eternal realm. The eternal realm has no mass, so to speak, like we do. You know, this book, this is mass. Your chair is mass. Your ma everything around you has mass, right? We're also uh, space, right? There's space between me and Brenda right now. There's space between the molecules. There's space between my, the cells and my body. Amen? There's space between Earth and Neptune. There's space between the Sun and the Orion Nebula. Right? Space. And finally, the last part of our dimension is time. We live in a continual time continuum. You, our reality is a construct that continues forward in the fourth dimension one nanosecond at a time. So five minutes from now is, or about three minutes from now is going to be quarter to 11, right? That is a unit of time, and we trust that at quarter to 11, all of our reality is going to still be moving forward in time. So this, this whole digital reality moves forward in time. Right now, as I step and I walk closer to JD, I'm walking towards the future right now. And when I started over there, that was back in time. The construct that we see right now doesn't exist anymore. It's a thing of the past. It's fascinating, isn't it? But that's the way we have to understand, first of all, how our own world works. Amen? And when we get a, a basic grasp of that, we can start then understanding the differences with the eternal realm. Now, uh, locality, this is the word means that everything is local. I'm standing in a spot right now. My body is contained in this biological package that I'm in. It, my spirit is localized to my body. Now in the spirit realm, there's called non-locality. God is everywhere. He's omnipresent. God's locality is not in one spot. Amen? His presence, his every, it says the universe is held together by the power of his word. There is a power of God that holds all things together. His power and his energy and his presence in everywhere. Where can I flee from the presence of the Lord, the Bible says? Where can I hide from him? Why? Because God is non, the, the, the consciousness of God is non-local. Now, here's where God interacts with humanity. Part of him has become local in what? No. Keep, keep trying. Jesus Christ, who became a flesh person, put, uh, put uh, part of the Godhead in locality, right? So forever, Jesus Christ is going to be a man. Amen? So that's how God has bridged the gap between non-locality. Because How many know that, you know, when God is a non-locality being and we are a physical being, right? How are we supposed to relate to him? It's hard, isn't it? How am I going to relate to God who's everywhere, all-powerful? Isn't it a little difficult in a way, right? Right? So how did God bridge that gap? Well, he sent his son to become a man which bridged the gap between him and us. Now... We are, we are united with God, both spiritually, and when we resurrect, we're going to be united with him physically. Whose DNA are we going to have when we resurrect? Jesus Christ. His, his actual DNA is going to remake your, bo your resurrected body in, in his type. Like, you're not going to look like Jesus, but you're going to be of his DNA, just as my son is from my DNA, right? Amen? And so... The spirit realm is as endless, it's timeless. The, the thing that we do know that is contained in the spiritual realm is that it has energy, it's filled with energy, right? It does have energy. Obviously, the energy here came from where? There. It's filled with energy and it's eternal, it's outside of time. These are the things that we do know about uh, the spirit realm. But what's interesting is, is consciousness is the connecting point of both realms. All spirits are conscious. All spirits have a free will. 
just like we do. Every human being is conscious, and every human being has a free will. Spirits have a form of communication, and so do humans. We're a lot alike in that aspect. Amen? Now, inside of that, the Bible, the Bible gives us three realms of existence, right? We have the earth realm, which I would say is inside at the core. If you could, my best guesstimation is that earth is inside and surrounded by the spirit realm, or the, you could say that's the known universe, right? And we see that in uh, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. We are surrounded and enveloped by the spiritual principality of darkness, or the kingdom of darkness, Ephesians 6.12, right? Right now the earth is captive to the kingdom of darkness. Who's the god of this world right now? Satan, Satan is the god of this world. So we have a fallen principality, we have a fallen spiritual authority that the world is under. How, do, how can I prove this? Well, if God was in authority, there wouldn't be mass murders, there wouldn't be school shootings, there wouldn't be wars, there wouldn't be people dying of cancer, there wouldn't be all this stuff. Why? Because Satan is the God of this world. We are a fallen world. Amen? And he is yet to be displaced. And in fact, at the greatest point of history, Satan is going to become manifest in the flesh and actually be a physical king over the entire planet. Amen? Outside of all that, outside of the earth, then you have the kingdom of darkness which we're enveloped by. There's a dividing point where is the kingdom of heaven, right? Or where the abode of God or eternity. Revelations 4, 1 and 2 talks about it. Amen. The kingdom of God where Christ appears off the cross into the kingdom and they see him seated at the throne who is worthy to open up the scroll and all heaven says holy, holy, holy is the lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world. And the 24 elders bowed down and worshipped him and all the angels of God bowed to the Lord Jesus Christ as he appeared in heaven as both king and lord. That is where he is right now. So in between us and in between heaven is what? The kingdom of darkness. The Bible, we're going to get into some specific scary stuff. You're going to be blown away. That proves all of this stuff. So humans, the, 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 our mechanics, so to speak, right? Our blueprint is we're three-part being just like God. We're body, soul, and spirit. We're God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So we're made in His image. We have emotions. All the emotions we have, God has. He gets happy, He gets sad, He gets angry, He gets depressed. All those. God gets that too, right? Right? Amen? And so then God even further united humanity with Himself by allowing Jesus to experience life as a human being. So we're fully reconciled. So us, we're body, soul, and spirit. You're always going to be a body, soul, and spirit, except when you pass away. There will be a temporary time where it's, where it's called sleeping, but it doesn't mean you're not in existence. It means your body is in the ground and it dissipates and your spirit and your soul is at present with God. Amen? That is not forever. That is not forever. You're not flying around with wings playing harps for eternity. You're going to be in a world just like this for eternity except perfected. Amen? Spirits... Our consciousness and energy, as we talked about, that's what the Bible says. They are conscious. The, uh, a spirit has a limited uh, locality, but not the same as a human being. They could pass through walls. They can come and go. They can manifest. We see all kinds of things in the Bible. I could talk for, for days and days about this stuff. Angels coming and going, demons coming and going, demons taking over people, demons talking to people, the devil talking to people, God talking to people. So there's all these stories of this interaction on a supernatural level. Amen? So the spirit realm is then divided into two kingdoms or two realms, right? And this is life in relations to the powers and the principalities. Ephesians, if you have your Bible, go with me to Ephesians Chapter 2, and it says this, 
And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lust of the flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, which were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love which he loved towards us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, for by grace you have been saved, raised us up with him, seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Amen? So that's us right now. That's, that's a right now, even though we're in, we are in the earth realm, a born-again child of God, at this moment is seated in heavenly places with Christ by faith. It's a mystery. Right now, you are ruling and reigning with Christ in the heavenlies. Why? Because there is a man right there. There is a man sitting on the throne of God, and by faith in him, you get the credit. Amen? So now the realm of death, or this fallen realm, the curse, is controlled by an angelic prince. What are the fruits of it? spiritually dead the world is spiritually dead amen now there are a lot of good people in the world i know atheists who are better than a lot of the christians i know right but still the outward behavior doesn't make you justified you are still fallen by nature and in need of the savior that is what the gospel says amen in the realm in this realm the world is in bondage to Satan and sin. I'm sure you guys would agree with that one based on the evidence. The realm, the earth realm, Romans 1.1 1, 1 says is under the wrath of God right now. Even right now the wrath of God is being manifest. Not in its fullness as the fire and brimstone. But the, the wrath of God manifest in this way according to Romans 1.1. 1, 1 that God has given people over to the desires of their own hearts. And so when you see a person with a reprobate mind, that is, an, is how the wrath of God manifests in the age of grace right now. Amen? When a person gets to a point that they reject God and they hate God, they are given over to a reprobate mind so that they, they are totally imprisoned to, to, the, to the, the, all these things. Drugs, whatever it is, right? How many have been there, right? I've been there. I felt the effects of this. When the reprobate mind, when you're under it, bad things are happening in your life. Amen? People are murderers, rapists, serial killers, dictators. Everything under the sun, right, is from a reprobate mind. You think Hitler had a good mind or a reprobate mind? He was under the wrath of God. Amen? He was under a satanic principality. That's an extreme example, but... You know, that's a good example. They are far from God. How are we brought near to God? That's right, through the cross, through faith in the cross. They are not part of Israel, or, or, and I mean by Israel the promises of God, the covenants. They are divided, and they have no access to God. Amen? Now, Colossians 1.13, Romans 3.24 talks about this. The realm of life is controlled by Jesus Christ or the kingdom of God. Here, as we read the scripture, we're made alive in Christ. We are spiritually alive, right? We are free. We have liberty in Christ. We are empowered by the Holy Spirit to live righteously. We, ex we will experience and do experience God's glory and eventually we will be glorified, right? We are near to God, right? We are the spiritual Israel of faith. We are one people and every believer has full access to God 24-7. Amen? So that is the difference between the two kingdoms and the two realms. It's very cut and dry. Very, very cut and dry. Amen? Amen? Now, the kingdom of darkness, let's define it. The kingdom of darkness in several areas of scripture are described by principalities and powers. What are they? Well, the answer, the phrase, 
Principalities and powers occur six times in the Bible. Always, in this case, the King James Version and its derivatives. Other versions translate it variously as rulers and authorities, forces and authorities, or rulers and powers. In most places where the phrase appears, the context make it clear that it refers to the vast array of evil and malicious spirits who make war against the people of God. The principalities and powers of Satan are usually in view here, beings that wield power in the unseen realms to oppose everything and everyone that is of God. If you are a saint of God, you will experience pushback from the dark side. Anyone ever experience it? I can tell you horrifying stories of various degrees, right? From little nuisances to all-out spiritual manifestations of darkness in my life, I can say. I mean, there are times when all of a sudden an oppression will come over, and it's like someone is crushing you to death, and it comes out of nowhere. Anyone ever experience anything like that? That is a spiritual attack. That is a spiritual attack. I'm trying to mature to a place now where, like, I need somebody to pray for me because that's what you need. When you're under that spiritual attack, you could be the happiest, joyous person and all of a sudden you feel crushed. And people, well, just cheer up. It's not that easy. It's not that easy. You know spiritual oppression. When that cloud gets on you, it's tough. That is a demonic attack. You know, there's all various ways to nightmares, fears, phobias, all these things are manifestations of a demonic attack upon the mind. Condemning voices, anyone ever get that? Yep. You're never going to mount to anything. You're never going to get over this. God is not good for you. You know, the promises mean nothing. You'll never change. You know, all those, those are thoughts of demonic spirits that invade the mind. And what the enemy tries to do is get you to take that thought and accept it as your own or think that it's from God. That's the trick of the enemy where well, we got to discern. Amen? So the Holy Spirit will never condemn you. That's the difference. You'll know when God's rebuking you. You'll know it. There's a big, clear difference the way God does it and the way the enemy does it. Amen? Right? I want, if you have your Bibles, we'll go to Daniel chapter 10. And I'm going to show you spiritual opposition and a clear, detailed teaching from the Word of God. Amen? Uh, uh, some of you are at Bible study. I said to read chapter 10. It is a dazzling, deep chapter about uh, a deep, 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 detailed look into the spirit realm. And here, here Daniel was seeking a message from the Lord. The Lord was giving him a vision, right? He gets this great revelation, but Daniel basically doesn't understand the revelation. So he says, he gets down on his knees and he says, I'm paraphrasing the story, you can go and read it. He says, Lord, I need understanding of the vision you have given me. And heaven is on lockdown. He doesn't get a thing, no answer. So he says, I'm going to fast. And Daniel goes on this 21-day fast he's, because he feels so strongly he has to hear from God. He's desperate because he can't understand this revelation. And he's going weeks of it, right? And all of a sudden, after 21 days, the bright lights turn on in his room and this uh, Michael the Archangel appears to him. And it was a, just an amazing scene and if you go down to verse 12, he says, Do not be afraid, Daniel, from, from the first day you set your heart on understanding this and humbling yourself before your God, your words have were heard and I have come in response. The very moment he prayed it, heaven heard it, immediately God said the, sent the answer. God did not wait to send the answer. So why did it take 21 days for him to get the answer? Well, listen to this. However, the prince of the kingdom of Persia was withstanding me for 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I have been left there with the kings of Persia. Now I have come... Now, excuse me, this is Gabriel talking right here. Now I have come to give you understanding of what will happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision pertains to the future. 
And so he goes on to give this vision, right? And he later says, he, he then touched me in verse 18, do not be afraid, he strengthened me, man of high esteem, do not be afraid, peace be with you, be, be courageous and take courage. And as soon as he spoke to me, I received strength. And he said, may the Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. And he said, do you understand why I came to you? But now I shall return to fight against the prince of Persia. So I am going forth, and behold, the prince of Greece is about to come. However, what, what will, well, I will tell you what is inscribed in truth. There's, uh, on and on he goes. Who understands firmly with me, except these forces, except Michael, your prince. So you're like, wow, what the heck just happened there? So you have Gabriel, this messenger angel, gets dispatched, right? He get, as he's going between those two realms, right? Between heaven, through the kingdom of darkness to earth, he hits a wall. There's someone waiting for him. And there's a principality which is called the Prince of Persia. Now, obviously, right, there's a lot that we can learn from this. Let's go, let's go into it. So Daniel receives spiritual revelation, right? He seeks no answer. He seeks heaven, but he gets no answer. In a desperate state, he fasts. He feels it's so urgent that he gets understanding of this prophetic word. It has to be spoken immediately, but he can't give it until he understands it. Amen? After 21 days, Michael and, uh, fights through and, and uh, he appears with the angelic messenger from God to reveal the message, right? So an angel from heaven visits Daniel. There's the, uh, uh, the prince of Israel, which Michael makes himself known as the prince of Israel. And there's the prince of Persia, we, uh, we, we know as the Medo-Persian Empire, right? And so, let's go to the next slide. We'll take, some, we'll take some facts from this. When Daniel prayed for help to understand the revelation, the answer was dispatched immediately, right? The angel said, we heard you right away. And God said, here, go. Tell him this. He left immediately. It should have been an instantaneous response, but it wasn't, right? A demonic principality intercepted the messenger and Michael had to, f had, had to fight him as he passed through the fallen spirit realm and it is, that has somehow captured and surrounded the earth. So the messenger ergo got trapped. Michael had to go fight him. Michael was a chief archangel over the nation of Israel at the time. Don't ask me why, how, what, where, when, but that's how it works because that's the information we're given. So God had placed an archangel over the nation of Israel as its watcher, as its protector because the spiritual attacks were tremendous against Israel, right? And so Michael came to fight 21 days, okay? 21 days it took to battle this angelic or this demonic host to get through. Number three, Daniel's fast somehow interacted with this unseen battle. Somehow, Daniel fasting here was adding power to the battle in the netherworld. I don't understand why or how. These are just facts that we can logically deduce from what was going on here. Number four, the length of the battle in the spirit realm translated into 21 earth days until the aim to give the message, right? The prophetic word, the interpretation. Number five, the prince of Persia was a demonic entity which controlled and influenced the Medo-Persian Empire and its leadership. That has astonishing implications right there. Could we assume from this information that the nations of the world are controlled by various spiritual principalities that influence them? I would safe to say I can logically deduce that from this scripture, this detailed account. What God is telling us is how it's working, right? Now, of course, Christians take this to the ninth degree and they make these weird spiritual warfare teachings and this and that. That will wreck you if you're not careful with that stuff, right? He didn't say for, for Daniel to go and fight the principality, right? The angels were fighting the principality. Amen? 
Daniel sought the Lord in prayer, and that did add some sort of power, but Daniel wasn't doing the spiritual warfare. Who was? The angels were doing the spiritual warfare. How does the warfare work? We don't know. That information we're not given. But we do know that it took 21 earth days in that realm in between heaven and earth. However, that time or whatever works in, in that realm translated into 21 day battle. That's tremendous. But it gets even crazier than this. <clears throat> <clears throat> Michael was an archangel assigned as to protect Israel and had another battle to attend after this one. So he would leave, go back to fight the prince of Persia for God knows how long. We know in earth the Medo-Persian Empire lasted quite a while. <clears throat> but after Michael left and, 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 and the messengers, angels left, they would return to the spirit realm to battle after the prince of Persia, he said the, the prince of Greece is going to come. But here's the crazy thing. The Greek Empire didn't form till 300 years after this. Do you, do you see what I'm saying there? So he went back, Michael and these angels went back to battle the prince of Persia. And then he said, but after him, then we got to battle the prince of Greece, who's coming. So he may have battled the Persian Empire for 300 years in the spirit realm. After that, then he would start a new war against the prince of, of Greece, who many believe was Alexander the Great he was talking about. That is astonishing implications to that. My, when, I was learn, when I learned that stuff, like I know it's not deathifying, important. Jesus is always the center of what we preach. But God gave us a look into these things just to, to, to humble us. It's like, wow. Right now, I believe there's consistent and constant battle in the spirit realm between heaven and the kingdom of darkness. I believe that when Satan rebelled, it started a world war in eternity that continues to this day. Now, you know, when you read the original scriptures of Satan's fall, and Isaiah and Ezekiel and places like that, when Satan, who was a, the chief angel of all of heaven, he was the greatest of all angels. His name was Lucifer, right? And he stood next to God in command over heaven. And Lucifer was so close to God that, I don't know, we don't know how it happened, but we know he had a free will. And all of a sudden, Satan got to thinking, I think I could do a better job in charge. My personal belief is it had to do with the creation of Adam. I think that Satan got jealous. It's the only thing that makes sense to me, how it could happen. I think that Satan got jealous of Adam and said, no, I could do a better job than this. This is a... Uh, you know, all of a sudden Adam's getting all this attention and S Lucifer becomes a petulant child and rebels and convinces one-third of the angels to rebel with him. Evil touched heaven at one time. Evil spread throughout heaven and war, a civil war broke out inside the throne room of God. Astonishing, isn't it? So God experienced war inside of his own throne room. And the angels of God who were loyal rose up and they made war against the devil and God cursed him and kicked him out. Where did he show up? That's why I say I believe it coincides. Amen? What was Satan's target after, after he lost the battle to overthrow God. What was his next target? What's the first thing he went after? The object of God's love. And so Satan, I believe, I believe that Satan and the angels that were overthrown were warped. They lost the glory off of them. They became hideous beings in the spirit. They became darkness. Literal darkness.
So when uh, uh, any demonic spirit manifests, there is darkness. There is an absence of the life force of God. And we have to take it seriously because Satan and all the demons work through manipulation, they work through seduction, and they work through lies. Satan does not show up as a scary-looking being with a cow head on it, right? Baphomet, right? He shows up as an angel of light and disguises himself. He has the power to do so. And when he introduces a lie, it tends to be mixed in with a lot of truth. And he's seductive. I've had people, and I've experienced this, my wife and I, being in the presence of spiritual leader who are under the power of seducing spirits, and you become frozen where you, be, you can't even move, where you become almost dumb. You know, I had a couple who was in the presence of this same leader that we know, and they said when he was yelling at us and screaming at us and degrading us and ripping us out, we literally got frozen and I couldn't open my mouth. It was like the devil was right there in front of me. I says, I know exactly how you feel. When uh, um, Winston Churchill said, I would never step foot in the meeting with Hitler because I have heard how he can entrance people around him. Nivelle Chamberlain was entranced by Hitler's aura in his presence and signed over everything to him. They're like, what did you just do? People would say they were mesmerized in his presence, just hearing him talk. Why? Because he had an antichrist spirit. It's powerful stuff. There's a lot that we, that we can learn that we need to understand. And one other thing that we'll close with very, very quickly, one second example I'm going to give to you, Genesis chapter 6, 1 through 4. Let's go there. And we're going to close with this section. Now it came about that Joanne was cooking in her kitchen when men began to multiply on the face of the land and the daughters that were born to them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and they took wives for themselves, whomever they choose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever because, of, because he also is flesh. Nevertheless, the day shall be 120 years. And the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward. When the sons of God came into the daughters of men, they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. So the sons of men was not talking about flesh man. He was talking about spiritual fallen beings, right? He was talking about somehow... Some way, don't ask me how it works, but it happened. Demonic spirits manifested into flesh and actually inseminated women with their DNA and bore for them children, hybrid human beings called the, the Nephilim. They were hybridized human beings. I believe the mythological stories of the Greeks, of the Chinese, of the Native Americans are really talking about things that they saw at one time handed down from them by the forefathers. Remember the beast that would walk that had animal hoofs and a human body? Remember that? That pro might have, something like that might have existed. They were giants, the Anak they were called. They were a race of Nephilim that were giants. They appeared again somehow in, uh, in the Canaanite land. And when Joshua sent out the spies, they saw them. And he said, the Nephilim have come back. And the spies were scared of the Nephilim. When David fought Goliath, people don't realize this, Goliath was of Anak. He was a Nephilim. Do you see human beings that are 10 feet tall? No, because Goliath was a, a hybridized human demonic being. Notice what he did when he became forth to, to fight David. He cursed God. He mocked God. He's blasphemed God amongst all the Israelites as Goliath stood there. Who would do such a thing? A demonic principality. He acted, he looked like a demon. 
He spoke like a demon. He acted like a demon because he, he was a son of a demon. And so what happened was, God says in here, I have to destroy all flesh. And he numbered the years from this prophecy to 120 years. That didn't mean that man was going to live physically for 120 years. That means the hourglass started ticking. And 120 years was all that he had left. And then it goes on to talk about Noah. I suspect very strongly from the, from the evidence here that what the demons did, why they took the daughters of men to make hybridized human beings, is because from the seed of the woman would come the Messiah. And if the demons could entirely populate the earth with hybridized human beings and replace the Adam DNA, the original DNA of God, the Messiah would not be able to come. And so God's, I believe, and this is something you can look into, this is just my belief, right? This is not thus saith the Lord. I believe that, that Noah and his family were the last human beings on earth. I believe the entirety of humanity was hybridized by this demonic DNA in their systems to a various degree. What was the fruit of the world at that time outside of Noah and his family? Dina, what was the world? It was continuous evil and violence of the nth degree. Who would propagate such a thing? Satan. Satan. So God said, I have to destroy this flesh. I have to destroy this flesh, right? And God wiped the whole thing off. The corrupted humanity, all the Nephilim were destroyed in the flood. All the corrupted humanity, and the, if there was any human beings that were left, they were corrupt anyway, so it doesn't matter. God had to destroy it all. Why do you think not one person got, pre got saved at the preaching of Noah? Probably they couldn't. They were all evil. And Noah was not so much preaching to them, he was preaching to us. He was preaching the cross. And it's a type and shadow. Amen? And so it's just, it's just a, a fascinating, it's a fascinating look at the whole thing. And uh, we don't even have to go into the rest of the slides because I pretty much preached it all. But it, it's just a, a fascinating look. And somehow, some way, it happened again later on because we saw the Nephilim return to in, in the Canaan area and the sons of Anak, right? And the sons of Anak were from a... Anak must have been some sort of demonic principality that birthed forth another hybrid race of human beings. And here's... And I'm going to say something else to connect the dots. And people ask, why would God tell the Israelites to kill every man, woman, and child in Cana? What if they were Nephilim? What if the same thing was happening again and God had to wipe this strange flesh, as the Bible says, from the planet because Satan tried it again. He had to destroy Israel. And if you see it from a spiritual warfare perspective, okay, we, we understand the law perspective and everything that happened. We understand the law and the prophets. We see that from the word of God. But in the spirit realm, at the same time, you had nonstop spiritual darkness warring to try to destroy Israel. Why? Christ. Say it again, Sal. Because of Christ. Now Satan was panicking. He was panicking. All out war. I have got to kill the Jews. I have got to kill the Jews. I cannot let Christ be born. Now, let's fast forward to 1939. You all know where I'm going. There was a demonic antichrist spirit that possessed a man named Adolf Hitler. 
and I can t I'm, re I'm reading, I'm doing some study on it right now. In the, in the 1920s, Hitler, if he, in case you don't know his history, just really quickly, he was a loser. His dad was abusive. His mom was extremely contr controlling and cruel. And he went into, um, he served in World War I, and he became a corporal, and he was a really weird dude. He fought in the German army. Well, when he got back, he moved back to Vienna, and he was trying to be an artist. He wanted to be an artist. So he, he tried to get in Vienna art school, and his artwork was terrible, by the way. And a Jewish professor denied him into his class, into the program. And he began to hate this man, right? And so he began to fantasize having these thoughts about returning Germany to its glory and the Aryan people and this and that. And he was in a museum. And in this museum, there was both a spear that is said to be the original spear that pierced the side of Christ. And there was a sword, I forget the name of the, the Germanic king, that he used to um, start restart the, the German Empire back in like the 1400s. And he, him and a couple of his friends, and this is from his friends, um, what do you call it, his testimony. And he said, Hitler began to go to the museum every day and stare at the spear and the sword. And he would stare at it. And one day he said, there was like this glow in the room. And Hitler all of a sudden said, Spirit, I offer my body as possession for you to be used. And he said from that moment on, something went into him and he completely changed. And there was this power that came over him that turned into it from a total loser that he started going to the beer halls and preaching this demonic stuff about the Aryan race. And people were mesmerized and drawn to him. And people said, you are a great master who has come to save us. We yield to you, O oh, great master Hitler. And upon, unbelievably, he took control of Germany against all odds. It was astonishing how he came into power. And you know, the rest is history. When he issued the edict for Kristallnacht, anyone know what Kristallnacht is? You know, Robin, as Kristallnacht was an edict that he came out after he gave into power to destroy all Jewish businesses and shut down all the synagogues. And so the SS and the brown shirts went through all of Germany and began to smash and burn down the Jewish stores, their shops, and they began to arrest the Jewish people. And as the war started, they herded them into the ghettos. They called them the ghettos. And then when Hitler issued the final ultimatum, he had built, constructed concentration camps, and he said, we're going to exterminate all the Jewish race. And he began to do it. Six and a half million Jews were exterminated in a three-year period. It's, a, it's, it's frightening. Who was behind it all? Why does Satan still want to destroy Israel and the Jewish race? To stop the second coming of Christ. It's the last stop. We're already saved. When he comes, it's just to complete the process for us. Right? But God is coming to fulfill his promise to the Jews and his covenant. And so, for whatever reason, in time, Satan saw what was coming. Right? Right? and said, it, it's getting closer. I have got to kill the Jews. What's happening right now? The, the nation of Israel, out of the ashes of that, a miracle took place, and Israel was formed as a nation again. Why? Because it's in the prophetic timetable of God. And now there is a spirit, the same spirit at work, and it's not in Hitler right now. It's in the surrounding nations of Israel who are hell-bent on their destruction. And it all comes from these principalities that are influencing these people. Amen? Any questions or comments?
you can take Satan's plan, destroy any possibility of Christ right back to the garden. When God gave the promise in, in Genesis 3.15, okay, about the seed, and you look at the children of Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, I've given this a real heavy thought. Who was the one who was murdered? Abel. By who? Cain. Why? Well, first of all, Cain was evil. Second of all, God rejected his offering. Therefore, Abel was destroyed because God loved Abel. But what was the actual result of that in Satan's mind? Getting rid of Abel would stop the line of Christ. Exactly. See, all these things. You, I mean, it's all over the Bible. It's astonishing. When you look at it from that perspective, it's everywhere. Very, very excellent, excellent point. And if you look at the genealogy <coughs> of Christ and take it back, all the way back to Adam, and you look at every name that is mentioned in that genealogy and <coughs> place them where the Bible puts them, and what was going on at that time, what was Satan up to? Trying to destroy them and Israel to stop the coming of Christ. That's right. Now, the Satan wars against the church, and I'll tell you why he wars against the body of Christ. Obviously outside because we're the body of Christ and we're the good guys, right? We are harvesting Gentiles. And there's a ticker on God's clock called the times of the Gentiles. Every Gentile that gets saved is a tick. 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 It's a countdown. Tick. Tick. And God knows, every, God already knows because he's ahead in time, he knows every person in the dispensation that's going to be saved, and it's counting down. Tick. Up, oh, there's another one. Tick. And Satan gets, so Satan's try, wars against the church because he wants the Gentiles, and he wants to stop the countdown. So Satan, he's, he's insane. Right? You ever see a, uh, like a serial killer, there's a certain type of insanity they have? That's the mindset of Satan. You're dealing with a serial killer. It's madness, right? And it's all based on hate and murder. He's a murderer from the beginning, right? And so that's his nature. That's his nature. Amen. Powerful stuff.